and Social Services. Um, prior to that, she was Deputy Chief Sec Science Officer at the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. She also taught as a professor of family and community medicine at UC San Francisco. Um, and she's worked with a range of national organizations to advocate uh, for health equity and uh, uh, access to quality health care for minority and underserved populations. Um, and last, we'll have Clarence Carter. Clarence is the Director of the Office of Family Assistance and Acting Director of the Office of Community Services at HHS um, and, uh, and, and ACF. Um, and he was formerly the founder of the Institute for the Improvement of Human Condition, served as Director of the Arizona's Department of Economic Security, and Commissioner of the Virginia Department of Social Services. Um, so welcome to all of them, and I will turn it over to Bill. Uh, thank you, and I uh, don't know how I'm going to squeeze 20 minutes into seven, but I will try. Uh, so Steve Wagner uh, started this morning by urging us to focus on self-sufficiency and engagement and getting people off the sidelines. And one way to do that is to reconnect them to jobs and to the labor market. And that happens to be the, one of the big themes in my new book, so I am uh, shamelessly promoting it today. Uh, Larry, thank you for having a birthday party for my book. It was, lit it was literally released by my publisher just today. And for those of you who have written books, you know there's a long labor of love and hate that goes into it. <laughs> so um, my book thanks you. Okay, I think we're supposed to focus on policy, and I'm really going to try to do that, although I was very impressed with so many of the researchers who were here and the clever things they're doing with data and with new approaches. Uh, let me mention um, five approaches that I talk about in my book and that were also came up in one way or another today. Uh, the first is building skills. It's really about uh, training and, and retraining. Uh, the second is tax credits, uh, uh, the earned income tax credits, but possibly others as well. The third is uh, to what extent should we be using social insurance programs rather than means-tested approaches to deal with some uh, new issues we're facing in our society. And the fourth is um, universal national service for young people. Okay, why uh, those four and how does that relate to what we talked about today? First of all, why training? Well, I think that we heard today that even in a full employment economy, there's still structural problems, uh, there's still a skills gap, and we have people who have not been drawn back into the labor market even though we are at full employment. Uh, Carolyn Heinrich, showed us that we're not investing very much in this country. And she also pointed out that not all programs have been effective. She mentioned dislocated workers, for example. Um, and she mentioned the success of sectoral employment programs, which I think are very effective or particularly effective uh, for the same reason I think she does, which is you are really training people for jobs that actually exist and more partnerships between business, community colleges, and um, uh, employers are called for. Uh, I would add even a little harder than she did, uh, or other people on that panel did, about getting the private sector involved. Uh, and uh, why do we need to get them involved? Because that's where the money is. That's where the jobs are. And uh, we just gave away one and a half trillion dollars to corporations. We didn't ask them to do anything differently for that money. And we're all hoping that they will use some of that money to invest not just in all the things they usually invest in, but that will have spillover effects for their workers. But there's no guarantee of that. And so I think we need some modification of the tax law to encourage more private sector training, more private sector profit sharing with their workers. There are a number of very uh, uh, forward-looking companies right now that are doing that with some success. Uh, why tax credits? Well, I think we all know, and you heard uh, from the panel, uh, the first panel today from Bradley Hardy and others, 
that they've been very uh, successful. Um, the earned in income tax credit, it gets money to people and it encourages work. What's not to like here? And then it may even have these intergenerational effects we talked about in the last panel. Uh, and uh, we need this because wages have been stagnant and uh, we uh, have too many people who even if they're working full time cannot really um, support their families. And this is a, a big problem. So I have a tax credit proposal in my book. It's a little different than the EITC. It goes much further up the income scale to, in, to earnings of, of say $40,000. It's based on your individual earnings, not your family income. It is very marriage friendly and it is very uh, uh, good on reducing error, I think. Why do we need uh, to think about social insurance and not just means tested uh, safety net programs? First of all, uh, the economy has changed a lot. We have uh, as we all know well, a lot of new technologies, we have AI, we have robots, we have trade, we have decline in manufacturing, we have a lot of people who are losing jobs and don't have the skills to get into the new ones. Why not use social insurance to help people retrain? Why not life learning, lifelong learning accounts for that purpose? And if you put it in a social insurance system, it'll get better funded and it'll be more sustainable. Uh, it's not just economic change that we're dealing with, it's demographic change. Uh, you heard about that as well. Increased labor force participation of women on the second panel, growth of single parent families. People have work-life balance issues that they didn't have 30, 40 years ago. What are we going to do about that? It's very hard to both take care of your family and uh, work full time. And so we do need child care subsidies and we do need paid leave. Oh, I have one minute left. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, I have some proposals in that area. Uh, and um, I, I could say much more about that. But since I only have uh, half a minute here, why do we need national service, universal national service? We have a small program now called AmeriCorps, but it's very underfunded and, and very small. Because, as came out in panel two, in a really interesting way, I thought trust in each other and in our institutions is at an all-time low. And more government programs aren't going to solve the trust problem. And as that panel said, we need more civic engagement. Uh, we need more non-governmental programs. And, you know, government needs to organize this and help fund it somewhat, but I think this is one possible way to rebuild trust and sense of community, sense of civic engagement. I would add to Universal National Service what I call an American exchange program We're on the bottom half of the income distribution. So thank you for inviting me and um, great uh, a pleasure to be here and hear from all of you. Thank you. So Lonnie didn't mention when he introduced me that I, uh, prior to coming to AEI, I am a former administrator and uh, was the commissioner in both New York State and New York City for almost uh, 20 years. So my remarks are going to be informed more by that than my experience here in Washington in the last five years at AEI. And I, all, when I was commissioner, I love conferences like this because I would hear things that would then get me thinking and I'd go back into my offices and we'd pursue them. And I heard a lot of things of, in the panels today that made me feel that way and I wanted to go over them. Uh, so the first one was that Steve Wagner started us by making a very interesting remark about mandated or universal engagement in, in relation to work requirements. And he said they're not the same thing. And engagement is what is important. Work requirements may play a role, but this business that we're going to not let individuals who are clearly in need, who tell us they have no earnings, and are not disabled and have no other source of cash, but are only on SNAP and Medicaid, we maybe shouldn't just say, well, that's okay, we'll see you in a year. Maybe engaging them ought to be something we should do. So the requirement isn't only on uh, the recipient necessarily to do something, it's also on the program to wake up and pay attention to an, uh, a constituent group that is in need. Secondly, I, I have to say, as a former state official, I love Don Winstead saying, uh, to state other state officials, 
reporting requirements are your friends. That's very important. Because uh, it is true that one of the roles that the federal uh, government can have is asking the states to report, not just in the annual reports, but in, in between, how are they doing on various discrete problems and what are they doing to address the problems of people in their caseloads. And I don't think we do enough of that. And so I, I was so happy to hear Don, as a state official and a federal official, say the federal government can play an even stronger role in raising data up about what's happening in caseloads and finding out what states are doing about those issues that are, are, are discovered. So I'm constantly talking about what's happening with working age adults who report no earnings, who uh, when their case is set up in SNAP or Medicaid or housing, why, how many are they, where are they, what zip codes, and what are states doing about them. Um, I also have to say, Carolyn, I think, really hit it on the mark the sort of distressing labor force participation numbers, despite the growth in our economy and the strength of our economy, is the one problem we really have got to get focused on in a more significant way. Um, I did, I was struck that she, she said that I, you know, getting the workforce programs to, to work better to find potential beneficiaries of their programs seems to be a problem. They set up a program and they can't find anybody to take advantage of those programs. But the lists are there, and I'm, I, maybe, maybe I'm harping on this a little more, but the public assistance programs, Medicaid and SNAP, have lists of individuals who are not disabled, who are working age, and say they have no earnings. We could do a better job of linking those programs with workforce development programs. I was very grateful to Bradley Hardy for pointing out that uh, it is worthwhile to look at different populations and how they are benefiting or not benefiting from the, our economy or our safety <coughs> programs. And distinguishing me between African Americans and other populations is an important thing to do. And it raises issues that need to be addressed and focused on. Um, he also made a point that I think Bell makes very well in her book, and that is relieving poverty, helping people to have income or resources that gets them above the poverty line is an accomplishment. But it's not everything. And people are still struggling. And there's a second order of responsibility for all of us to help Americans who are in that lower middle class group who are struggling too and falling behind. How do we get them even further up? And so I think I, the way I think of it is, is they really are two different jobs. One job is to help people get to the first ladder. Another job is to help people get further up. I worry that if poverty fighters try to get people all the way to the middle class, they will neither get them above poverty or get them to the middle class. But we shouldn't forget that there are two tasks that need to be tackled. So I thought Bradley was very good on that. Of the Marians, um, Marian Page, I have to say, Marian Page, I'm, I'm sorry, when we talk about poverty measures, I really think we have to really describe the inadequacy of the official poverty measure, the extent to which all of the things we do, or most of them, in the safety net programs are not counted in determining official poverty measure. There are others, there's the supplemental measure, there's the Christopher Weimer anchored measure of poverty that I think shows great progress in how our safety net program works. And then of course there's Bruce Meyer's consumption poverty measure. Those are important details to be aware of that shows that the people who work in the safety net program, the people in this country who've developed and created the safety net program have made great progress in relieving material hardship. What we haven't done so well on is helping people earn their own success and I think that's uncovered when we get past the official poverty measure. Um, Marion Page, or Marion Bittler, um, you know, I, 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 work, I ran the TANF program in New York State, in New York City. I, I, I was there when, you know, I was part of the first implementation team in New York State and New York City after the Welfare Reform Act passed. I do sometimes think we spend an awful amount of time still talking about TANF when we have these vast other programs that are much more significant in the lives of low-income Americans, and we don't spend enough time on those other ones. And that's the case here. A recent paper by Jason Furman, I think, very clearly showed that in response to the recession, our various safety net programs responded quite dramatically in shoring up incomes at the very bottom. They didn't do that much for people in the lower, lower middle, but they did address issues concerning low-income Americans. And to just focus on TANF, I think misses that bigger picture. And I think that's important to remember. Um, also, I would point out that you know, we are um, 
you know, this is a HHS sponsored, so we can't spend that much time talking about SNAP, I understand, or EITC, but there are other programs within the HHA world. Like, I think we got a little bit into childcare, that was good. The childcare program has is, is got important responsibilities and has gotten a significant new investment. I'd like to know more about how that's playing out. And then, we didn't say anything about child support enforcement today. Not a word, I don't think. And that is an important role in people's lives. I think it's been an unappreciated role in low-income families' lives, both in helping single uh, parents, mostly mothers, get the support they deserve and should have to help them raise their children, but also to help the non-custodial parents uh, both fulfill their responsibility and earn what they can to support their children. So I think that there's a sort of an underappreciated uh, 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 area there. And then finally, I, I was sort of struck by the, 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 top, the topic titles and how they contrasted a little bit with what people decided to talk about. And so the, you know, promoting opportunity and independence, and I think Carolyn was right on the labor force participation issue. That's really what we want to do. How are we gonna get people to take advantage of the opportunity that employment offers and get become independent? And what I'd like to see is a state-by-state -state evaluation of that labor force participation measure so we can see where are the labor force participation rates a little higher and why is that happening and what can we learn from those states uh, to do both within our safety net programs and within our general policies to make uh, help people get get to work. I one of the uh, favorite thing that I think both two scholars did and they 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 put up the a fancy chart and it had a lot of variation, right? The states were all over the place. And they said this can't be optimal. And I get that. I get that. But we learn a lot from the differences. And what we really want to do is focus on those who are succeeding call attention to it, and then bring that to the attention of those who are not succeeding. And that is one of the benefits of our federal system. And federal officials and state officials should be constantly looking at themselves in relation to themselves in the past and in relation to their fellow states so that we can all improve together. Thank you. direction of Robert's trajectory, which is, I started working with Robert. And, and now you're here. Now I'm mm. in Wisconsin uh, and in a county-run system. So it's been interesting to see from the federal research side and then back down to the state and in a county-administered system how some of this plays out. And I just have to say thank you to Robert and to Secretary Anderson, who are both here today, who are my mentors. So I just have to say thank you. Um, so, I think this timing of this discussion is fantastic uh, because the economy is really good. And that presents an enormous opportunity and motivation for a focus on connecting those who are not engaged with employment. And so I think we have to remember in this audience that there are real people who have been disengaged and who haven't been able to connect with that ladder, and this economy is creating an environment where that is a realistic option for them. I talked with a uh, Milwaukee County judge um, a month ago, and he was saying, you know, for the first, he did child support, and he said, for the first time in a long time, if, if a non-custodial parent comes into my courtroom, I can say, hey, go work with this person, and I have confidence that they will be able to get a job if, if they don't have some debilitating condition. And that is an encouraging place to be. So I think we just have to keep that in mind about the present opportunity. Uh, more specifically to sort of reactions to the panel, um, a few amplifications, a couple of things I hope we don't forget about, and a couple of research questions from my perspective. Uh, one amplification is on um, Don's point and to Robert's point as well, the importance of federalism and accountability struck me. Um, it's easy to forget that we have federal statutes and federal rules and federal policy and federal uh, dear colleague memos and then we have state law and we have state rules and we have state policy and all of these things, um, they have purposes and they also constrain 
creativity, right? And so I think we have to be careful in, in restricting the space where uh, state and federal governments can exercise some creative problem solving capability in addressing some of the unique factors that different areas have. Um, and I just wanted to put that back on people's minds. Um, the second item is, is around families. You know, much of the research today focused on childcare, focused on panic. We talked about the EITC. We talked about a few of these others. When it hits the ground, it's the same family, right? And so we are looking at, we are looking at these, you know, the marginal effects of the individual programs. And I think it's useful as we contemplate an agenda of research and thinking about practice, and certainly those at the state level know this, um, we have to keep in mind how these things work together and how we can have space for them to work together. Because if we're just looking at independent marginal effects, we're leaving a lot on the table, right? Um, so number two, things I hope we don't forget about. Um, we had a brief mention of, uh, and I have not read your book, Bell, so I confess. <laughs> You couldn't possibly have since it just got born. <laughs> yeah, and, and so maybe this, uh, maybe that's addressed in that book. But I think often we we forget about some of the differences across the country in terms of how these programs operate. Service delivery in very rural areas is very, very different from cities. It just is, and so as we think about how these programs work and how they work together and what research looks like. I hope we keep in mind that some of the resources and integrative capabilities and administrative structures and effects really and cultural differences are just pretty vast. And again, I think pointing back to the value of, of some federalism and space for creativity, I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, the second point that I Robert and I did not compare notes, but um, the absence of child support enforcement also struck me. Um, again, all of these programs come down often on one family, and a non-custodial parent is often a part of that family and is a key contributor to that. And if we look at the labor force participation challenges that have been mentioned, especially among less educated men, um, it would suggest to me that maybe the role of child support enforcement in helping non-custodial parents and particularly fathers um, move toward employment and supporting their families and being engaged in their families. And the research of Chetty that was discussed pointed, at, pointed that out today too. We looked at some of the mobility differences between communities where fathers were engaged and those where fathers were not. And so, I think as we move forward, it's important not to forget about child support enforcement, not just in the capacity of extracting funds, but of being a critical support of a family um, and, and of uh, parenthood and, and of engagement, sorry, of that non-custodial parent in employment and engagement with the family. Number three is a uh, broad research question. So, one specific thing that would be of interest to me, we talked a little bit about disability. Um, as probably many of you who work on the ground know, this, that, one minute, um, the, the trend has been going up and it's, it's kind of noticeable when you're on the ground. Um, but I would be interested to know, particularly for uh, children with disabilities who have been in the program, we looked at some of the evidence once they were on the program as kids and then were determined off as adults, it would be interesting to know at the outset um, if there were some way of researching what, what the future employment effects of entry into the program as kids versus other supports uh, would show. Um, and then the second one is, is really, we didn't talk, talk a whole lot today about engaging people who are disengaged. We really didn't. We really didn't talk about that much, and that's the immediate opportunity. And I think there are a lot of challenges and, and sort of broader questions about um, what is the role of government in 
in the lives of people who may not be in a program. Um, and a lot of our, a lot of the people who are struggling most are totally disconnected. Maybe some of that is some of the cultural issues that you deal with. Um, and maybe that's the approaches of our programs. Maybe that's the role of community groups. But some additional targeted looking at what, what engagement and activities leading to and supporting work I think would be very beneficial moving forward. Thank you. As a recovering academic uh, family physician, I was excited to hear about regression analyses and economic modeling. Uh, I don't get to think about that much in my role now as cabinet secretary, where we are challenged. I have authority over Medicaid, um, over SNAP, over TANF, over CCDF funding, and we're often trying to really think about the levers and evidence-based strategies to combine those authorities into ways that feel more seamless not only for our staff, but also for our clients. And we are struggling with that. So I would love to have a group of thoughtful people help me figure out how to best use the uh, range of data that we have to think about what's working and what's not. My state's small, it's about a million people, but yet we still are one of two states that has seen a downward trend in our poverty levels. And it's this intersection of culture and need and outreach we're working very hard on engagement, but that word is a little bit fuzzy. And how do you best engage? What does that mean? How do you create these linkages uh, with community partners who really know how to speak the lingo, who are from the community, of the community, and know how to create these trusting bonds? We're working hard on experimenting in a rapid cycle way, but that doesn't lend itself easily to programmatic evaluation and long-term trend lines. I, I think there are huge opportunities for us to move earlier and earlier in terms of apprenticeship and life skills training. We're really trying to think about how to build in flexibilities to do that and think about the dual generation approach. Our governor is committed to this and we're bringing together cabinet agencies who have touch points with the same families and we could probably count them and name them, but I could not tell you the way to connect the data points because there are many restrictions around how to do that at the state level. That would be something high on my agenda for uh, policy solutions. Additionally, when you think about healthcare, uh, we talked about it, one of Marianne's thoughtfully brought in Medicaid. There are huge, it's about half of my budget, but yet I can't yet pull in food policy from SNAP and WIC to help promote better health. That would be to better savings and health outcomes, by the way, in my Medicaid population. Why is that so difficult? I have no idea. Um, but I think a policy agenda that would leverage that ability to be incredible and influence the family unit and influence long-term outcomes that go beyond just uh, the, the childhood uh, phase. We're really also struggling with uh, the disparities questions, particularly because we know that they exist. They exist whether you're looking at racial and ethnic disparities, language disparities, uh, educational differences, at differences in income level that have persisted. Uh, intergenerational poverty certainly is influencing all kinds of outcomes uh, that we're struggling with around violence and crime and uh, social mobility, but yet we're really trying to figure out how do you move beyond just measuring it and create solutions around these social determinants of health. Maybe it is using TANF for housing, affordable housing. Maybe it's leveraging opportunity zones uh, for investing in additional affordable housing because those intersections don't yet exist and we can't yet use other types of funding, again, whether it's Medicaid to promote better health uh, or rapid rehousing uh, strategies. I, I think that there are huge opportunities, again, to think about um, ways to merge these um, programs and silos and reporting and how we really move beyond. I don't think it's necessarily a UBI type approach as it's currently being experimented, but probably some new version of it that we haven't yet thought of or constructed and, um, and with additional state flexibility from all of these siloed programs that again, are probably going to the same set of at-risk, on the edge families who are reaching this benefits but could be very powerful. And in a small place at a board of small, a county level, you probably could really try out 
uh, and experiment for a short duration and see what works for whom uh, under what circumstances. And I think that's our biggest challenge. If, if I would uh, want to lay one priority out, it really is figuring out whether we're talking about engagement or outreach, we're talking about what is most effective. It's, it's building in the evaluation along the way and investing in that as, as much as we invest in the administration reporting. Uh, because we have a lot of focus on making sure those error rates are in and we're you know, doing the verification, but we don't necessarily have the same infrastructure in place for investing in the evaluation of components of programs that are working uh, to get to people uh, who most need it and to move them into sustainability and fix these jobs. Thank you. Secretary Odom Walker asked the question, why is it so difficult to be able to use the programs that I administer in conjunction to achieve some kind of other result? The reason it's so difficult is because they were never intended to work together. Each one of those programs were designed singularly with a singular intention. And so therefore, we end up on at the operating level, trying to rig those things together with bubble gum and spit to make something happen. It is my principal argument that our safety net, it is an aggregation of single purpose programs that was designed without any intention. And so therefore, if you don't know where you're going, any road will lead you there. And I would argue that first, that what we need to have is a true north or an overarching intention. And I would say that that overarching intention ought to be growing the capacity of as many vulnerable individuals and families, growing them beyond that vulnerability to be able to reduce their dependency. We ought to see the system of public supports in our society as a mile marker in a life's journey, not a destination unto itself. And, and, and so if we were to have this overarching objective, which would be to grow capacity to reduce dependency, to enhance the human condition, then we could then align all of our assets in support of that of that objective. I would argue that part of the challenge of the design of our system is that what program administrators are held accountable for is the administration of programs. They are not held accountable for enhancing the human condition. They are not held accountable for strengthening the, uh, the, the individuals in their community. Now, they come to the work with that intention, but that's not what they get held accountable for. And you just heard the secretary talk about, of course, all the reporting requirements. And if, it's th if those things don't happen, that's what you get named for. Okay? Um, and so I would argue that if we, approached the, uh, if we approached the system of public supports, the same thing happened, with an objective to in strengthening the human condition to grow as many people beyond that, um, beyond, beyond their vulnerabilities as possible so that they could live a life of their own choosing with reduced supports, that would completely change the trajectory of, of the way our system worked. Uh, Robert Doerr said you know, it was uh, <clears throat> chagrined that there was no discussion of child support enforcement. 
And I think that that buttresses the point that I am making that when you attempt to approach the discussion from the category of individual programs or individual silos, you're going to leave something out. Okay? But when you think about human well-being, when you think about the notion of growing people beyond, then all of it makes sense. That you have to factor in, you have to focus on work, you have to focus on nutrition, you have to focus on education, you have to focus on family connectivity. All of those things become, become part of the discussion when you have an overarching intention to strengthen that individual or family and help them grow beyond that movement. And so I think that we have to use this perfect storm moment to shift our intention from the administration of individual programs to a focus on growing the capacity of our society, strengthening our society by strengthening her people. And with that being our, our, our predicate, it would allow us to align all of the potential resources in furtherance of that agenda. So I'm not even sure I'm needed up here, but we want to open it up for discussion. Um, and I really, you know, this is a, a great opportunity to get ideas out there. So, you know, feel free to ask questions or feel free to pose ideas, to pose thoughts. You know, how do we think about implementing a vision like the one that, that Clarence proposes? How do we design it? How do we implement it? How do we pay for it? Um, you know, how might we best engage different populations? Um, how might we better coordinate, uh, given the, the, the current system we have across silos, across populations, um, and across programs that are largely serving the same people? And then, you know, I personally would love to hear from some of the uh, policymakers and practitioners, what are key research questions you really need answered and that you need uh, the, the research community to address? Um, so with that, I'm going to open it up. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sherelle Campbell Street. I'm from the wonderful state, the volunteer state, Tennessee. Um, and um, I, today I just want to say thank you very much to each of the panelists and the information that has been provided. Um, but I want to introduce a program that um, we have not really talked about in terms of serving persons with disabilities, and that's the vocational rehabilitation program. Um, I've heard a lot today about um, services to persons with disabilities in terms of employability, but one thing that we have not talked about is the VR program. There are over 80 programs, one in each state, and its sole purpose is to assist people with disabilities to go to work. Um, I would be interested in, from a research standpoint, to find out has there been any work um, or research done to find out exactly how um, wonderful that program has been in assisting people go to work. Additionally, um, when President Barack Obama signed into law the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act in 2014, there was a mandate in the law that stated that the VR program would now have to set aside 15% of its total budget for services to students with disabilities. Now what makes that difference is for the first time ever, we would have to serve as a program those students with disabilities who are 14 years of age and older. This includes those students and families that are receiving SSI and SSDI. Um, one of the things that you would do through that service is pre-employment transition services. Now I didn't come up with the acronym PETS, but that's what it is. Um, the pre-employment transition services is geared toward assisting youth with disabilities get a first-hand knowledge on how it is um, in terms of job readiness, what things you need to know about job readiness, about work, at an earlier age. Additionally, with the VR program, one who receives SSI or SSDI is presumptively eligible for the program, and a lot of the services for which we are talking about is covered under training for the VR program. So um, as we talk about services for persons with disabilities, um, let us keep in mind that the VR program has been around almost 100 years and resides in the Department of Education, the Rehabilitation Services Administration, the administrator, I believe, is right across the street. 
Um, and it is a very good program, but it would be interesting to know just how um, other states are utilizing that. Um, the other thing is, um, I've, I've heard a lot of discussion about um, medically frail or incapacitated. I want us to be mindful of how we speak of the people that we have the honor and privilege of serving. Um, this is around the work of framing how we talk about people. Um, assuming that someone with a disability cannot work or is socially impacted by their disability at a disadvantage without first giving them the opportunity to at least try, I think is doing a disservice. Uh, we should first seek to assist until proven that those services cannot result in competitive integrated employment. Um, so just wanted to get those points out. And um, lastly, to shout out Clarence Carter. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I have learned in my role as deputy commissioner with the state of Tennessee is, um, you know, man wrote laws. And a lot of the federal laws that are written have a lot of things like shall and may in it. But I would encourage everyone in here to go back and read to see where there are opportunities to be more innovative. Just because something has been done the exact same way over 20 years does not mean that that is the case today. There is a lot of um, human service value curve opportunities out there, a lot of intergenerational op opportunities. We created a new eligibility using language from CCDF to serve people who um, economically did not qualify to be a part of, of TANF. However, they were still poor enough um, that they needed child care, and the only thing they needed was child care. And we have smart steps in Tennessee, and that serves people who need um, assistance only with child care. They didn't ask for SNAP, they didn't ask for TANF, but they do need assistance in caring for their children. So I would just encourage everyone, go back, talk to your federal partners as we've done with Clarence, and say, this is what we want to do. If we don't hear from you, we're going to assume that, yes, we can do it. <laughs> so there's a... Oh, do yeah, yeah. I, I want to thank you for bringing uh, the disability issue up. Um, I was particularly impressed with uh, Manasi's Men uh, charts. Uh, one of the benefits of we believed in New York that there was a way to engage uh, individuals who may have a physical or mental incapacity uh, and get them on the path toward employment and make sure they had every opportunity. And I have felt for some time that the SSI and SSDI programs don't sufficiently make that possible once people are determined eligible. And I think that is an area where uh, a lot of uh, uh, opportunity for innovation could happen. Uh, I did notice that the caseloads and the entrance to disability have dropped uh, in the last year or two. And I think that's partly because this opportunity of the economy has made work more attractive, uh, and I think that we ought to uh, continue in the way that you describe in trying to never give up on the possibilities of people uh, who want to work uh, to work. And, and yeah. I, if, I, if I could, um, Sherelle, I think that your, your, your point it speaks to another aspect of this transformation that I hope that we can usher in. If we can move from a system that operates from the perspective of the program administered to the perspective of the person or family served and begin the conversation there. What is it that that person or that family needs to grow beyond this moment? Then we can look out to the constellation of assets to meet that objective as opposed to working down through the program. And so this is what I have to be able to do. So it allows, we need to shift the lens Good afternoon. Um, I'm from the Child Support Office in D.C., so I'm so glad that you guys mentioned child support. And I thought it was interesting that it wasn't mentioned when child support literally lifts kids out of poverty. It's not making women rich. It's literally $200 a month. It's the difference between poverty and not being in poverty. So I thought it was interesting that it was never mentioned. Um, I'm, from, I'm in the policy division, and I guess I was looking for, I don't want to say new ideas, but for lack of a better word, we already are taking a holistic approach to child support, 
We have three people in our office who are dedicated exclusively to helping non-custodial parents find jobs. Um, we are at court, we have a father in court program. We work with the court when we deal with the psychological issues surrounding this child support. We help fathers become better fathers by giving them tickets to take their kids to see a baseball game. Um, so, I'm not trying to say we've done everything that we can do, but I guess I was looking for, I guess I was looking for new, newer ideas, um, things that I could take back, because that's kind of why they sent me here. Um, we have already <laughs> taken a holistic approach. Um, another issue that we're having, though, is that um, some of our child support roles are going down, as or TANA, and it's not because people are getting out of poverty, it's because poor people can't afford to live in D.C. So I think that when we're analyzing information, we need to make sure it's not like, oh, it's getting better. No, the poor people are just kind of shifting in another direction. So I'm not sure if that was a question, but thank you for acknowledging the importance of child oh, support. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The, I, were, I was the child support director in New York, and we also have a, a non-custodial parent EITC, which I think you have in the district as well. Uh, that's another way you can uh, incentivize uh, the payment of child support. There are efforts to forgive arrearage. There's ways to address uh, child support debt when people are incarcerated. Those are ideas. But the thing that I think is needed is, is a greater effort to engage custodial parents in other programs that don't have a strong linkage to child support enforcement the way TANF does. So SNAP and Medicaid, there are many single parent households there who are receiving public assistance and getting no child support, don't have a child support order, don't have paternity established. And those services are important services that actually benefit both the family and the child and the mom and the dad if they are properly executed. And I think for some time now the child support enforcement office has been afraid or reluctant to market the benefits of its programs, program to custodial parents who are benefiting from other uh, public assistance programs. And I would urge you to, to work on that. You're not, some people are going to say no. I think that's actually not in the long-term interests of their families. But uh, we can do a better job there. thinking of um, welfare programs like the EITC and food stamps and the non-welfare programs that provide uh, benefits to children and their families as investments. Because I think that relates to the type of rethinking welfare, promoting opportunity and independence. So if there's evidence that providing security through income transfers leads to independence and opportunity of the children, we need to pay attention to that. And I think it's useful to frame the discussion. If you think about historically, what the United States led the world in is free public education. No one talks about workplace education. And now that that means, we can think of medical as being like education. We know that medical care is essential for development of children. The evidence there is overwhelming. We've got today a presentation of the importance of income for the good development of children. And I want to finish with one suggestion that goes back to what Bell, Bell has a book, which I haven't looked at, but I look forward to uh, reading it. But I want to suggest one thing, because she did mention child tax credits. So the child <coughs> tax credit is now $2,000 per child. Everyone gets it except the very rich and the relatively poor. There are many more poor people that don't get it. But the cost of extending eligibility to the poor children who are not now eligible give them $2,000 a year is only about $12 billion. That would provide economic security for the poorest children in the country. I can't think of a better investment to promote opportunity 
Thank you, everybody on the panel. Um, Mr. Carter, I wrote down almost everything you said because I'm right with you. I agree wholeheartedly with what you're saying. And I think most of the states, we have moved to a more holistic approach to families. Uh, and, but I really like focusing on how are we strengthening the human condition. But my question to you is, when it comes to data, you know, if we could share data around within our agency with uh, researchers, that would be really helpful. But federal law, federal regulation, oftentimes prohibits us from sharing data. If we could move money, federal money, and allocate it to workforce or other things from one staff to another, that would be really helpful. But federal law and federal regulations prohibit that. We're, allowed, we're supposed to keep, keep track of different statistics and analytics of what we're doing, focusing more on taking actions, not on strengthening the human condition. And the reason we do that is because federal law and regulation requires it. So I guess my question is, when is the federal law and regulation going to change so that we can focus on the human condition? Thank you. A couple of thoughts in response. First is, it would be very helpful when a state is attempting to do something specific that you can show that the rules confound, to bring that to our attention and allow us to bring together our federal colleagues to see if we can't help figure a way through that. Another dimension of that is there are times, and because I have been on both sides of this equation, both the, well, well, federal, state, and local, there are often times when the states cede authority to the federal government that it doesn't have. Um, and, and, and so a, a combination of sort of understanding a particular you know, policy or regulation and then allowing us an opportunity to have a specific conversation about what the objective is to see where we can help. What that will allow us to do is in the near term, demonstrate two things. Demonstrate one, the effectiveness of freeing up the, the, the state and the locality to be able to employ its vision and it will also showcase the stupidity of some of the rules that we have. That, that we, we don't have, we, we are able to have an abstract conversation about this rule doesn't work for that rule. If we're able to show specifically where they are confounding us from achieving the objective of growing capacity to reduce dependency, I think that will create an environment more conducive to being able to change the, uh, to, to change the just one closeout thought. We had a, um, a conversation with the state of Ohio. Um, Ohio wanted to, to have a waiver. Uh, um, the previous administration had allowed um, waiver authority around the uh, work requirements in TANF. And there was only one state that had, uh, that had submitted an application for that waiver. Well, that's, it sat for two years. And then when this administration came in place, the, uh, the, the, one of the first objectives in Health and Human Services was to close down that waiver authority because we didn't want to do anything that could even be perceived to reduce the work, uh, to reduce uh, the emphasis on employment. And so uh, Ohio had uh, again put in that request. And what we were directed to do was we could not grant that authority but we said we're, we're directed to work with Ohio to see if we could help them achieve their objective. Their senior policy folks came in and sat with our policy team. They laid out their objective, and in the morning, we were able to help them 
figure out how they could accomplish that which they set out to accomplish without a waiter. It was a simple thing, but it was a specific ask around a specific set of challenges. That's why I go back to raise the issue, and we can certainly convene our partners to see if we can help you work through what it is we're all trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Russ Sykes from APHSA. I have a question in the tax policy world that hasn't been brought up that I'd like to uh, uh, see what your thoughts are. Um, one, Robert, I'm glad you mentioned that New York is a forerunner with the NICA study of EITC, which I think makes a lot of difference uh, for people who are current and their child support. Uh, but the other place New York is a forerunner with the only state in the country that has made our child and pay care credit refundable. Uh, the fact of the matter is the federal credit only offsets tax liability, and even though our eligibility is high, to the federal credit. Uh, we fully refund the excess over and above the family's liability, which helps reimburse them for their out-of-pocket child's care costs, which have soared to a level above the cost of a public university. And I'm curious, while it would be costly, it seems to be it would be an enormous help for a lot of uh, middle-income families, particularly uh, that are not being helped uh, uh, in, in that fashion, cannot get subsidies, and it also would drive more people to formal care, because you're not able to claim that credit unless you're using someone who reports their income so I'm just curious your reaction. It's a very good question, and I think, uh, I can't remember if it was the Marians or Liz who mentioned the uh, refundable version of the child care tax credit um, and the fact that as it exists now, it's not refundable, uh, and it is very, very uh, tilted towards well, very well off, very affluent uh, families with children. And so there is bipartisan legislation that's been introduced in the Congress, I think it was in the House, if I remember correctly, uh, to do exactly that. So the issue is on the agenda, and it even has some bipartisan support. So I guess my advice is uh, keep raising that and keep uh, fighting for it. And I would just say I think that the area of child care assistance is, is just way too complicated. I mean, there's the child care tax credit, refundable or not. There's the child tax credit, re refundable or not. There's the child care block grant, uh, which just got a significant increase. And certainly as former administrators, we use that uh, to help uh, low-income families afford child care. And then there's the the quality issues. So I think that this is an area where, you know, maybe a conference all by itself right. on, <laughs> on the way in which, the uh, way it actually plays out on the ground in families. I do think that um, we do provide, through refundable tax credits, federal, state, local, EITC, and child tax credit, um, uh, support for low-income working families and I think that's a good thing. And I think the more that we make sure it both provides assistance for people to provide adequate care for their children, but also always incentivizes work uh, is, a, is something we should focus on. And we didn't even mention paid leave. Oh, <laughs> I just wanted to follow up on, on, on that comment um, about the, the, so one of the things we, we know from the research on like parental employment and children's well-being is that there's, um, you know, the best situations for children in the very earliest stages of, of life varies quite a bit, right, in terms of the parent, you know, what work opportunities they forego by, going to, by staying home versus continuing work. Um, what the options are for, for the kids. And you were just mentioning, Robert, the complexity of our current system. So, you know, one of the, the things, I don't know if this is, and I'm sure Bell has, has you know, talked about this too, is, you know, we thought about rather than child care, but child allowance. So, for example, the parent that wants to, in, in benefits from the state, and the child benefits from the parents staying home, uses some of that, those resources to replace income that's foregone by not working versus a, giving the parent the full choice to say, I'm going to use it for child care, I'm going to use it to supplement for income that I'm foregoing because I'm staying home with my child. And I don't know to what 
extent um, you think that is is a politically viable uh, option? You go ahead. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure it's, a, it's such a big topic, but I mean, we do have a child tax credit right now that's quite generous, as you know. And the problem is, as has already been said, uh, I think it was um, Irv, uh, it is not uh, fully refundable at the bottom. And uh, so uh, I'm, I don't, I, you may have an argument about what's the difference between a refundable child tax credit and a ch children's allowance. I don't see them as being that different, but you can correct me if you have arguments about that. And I think the problem is the one that Irv identified and that uh, Senator Rubio did try to work on uh, and failed. Um, I also think that um, there is some advantage to, uh, or that at least there's a difference, we can argue about which way it goes, between child tax credits, as Robert just said, and uh, child care tax credits. One is linked to either work or going to school, in other words, you have to either be working or going to school to get it, and the other is not. And as you just said, some people believe that we should be supporting caregivers to and enabling them to stay at home. I don't think it's ever going to be, uh, anytime soon anyway, politically feasible in this country uh, to pay people to stay home. Uh, we used to do that. It was called AFDC, and it kind of went away because right now the focus is on, on work, and I'd like to um, sort of go with the momentum right now on a more work-oriented agenda. I, I will say something while I have the mic, and since nobody's hand is up, <laughs> about paid leave. I mean, I think really, as I mentioned briefly, we have a labor force participation of women that granted is much higher than it used to be, but hasn't been increasing since about 2000. Now, those of you in the research community know that, but I don't know if everybody else does. And in, the other thing that's really notable in my view is it's much lower in this country, the female labor force participation, than it is in other advanced countries. And one of the reasons for that, which has been documented with very good research, is because we don't do enough uh, with either childcare or paid leave or other uh, policies that make working and taking care of your family uh, possible or easier. So I'm just going to say something on the on the TAT allowance too, partly because we have proposers of of two different TAT allowance proposals in the room. I mean, so it is worth saying. So I don't uh, think it, there's any chance of one being enacted anytime soon either. I also the advantage over child tax. So, and so, I, and I also don't see that it's necessarily yeah. a difference whether you do it through the tax system or whether you do it through. Uh, 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 through a check. It'd be a lot oh, politically right. easier to do it through yeah. the tax system. Yeah. I mean, so the one tougher thing is potentially if you wanted to do it monthly, cutting checks mo or doing transfers monthly, but it okay. could be done. Um, but it is interesting that there are both empirical child support or uh, child allowance uh, randomized trials going on, so babies' first years, which is a five site uh, that, that's going to study the, a monthly child allowance on brain development, on uh, uh, you know normative child development. Um, and that there have been multiple proposals from both sides of the aisle in the last five or six years um, where people have, have proposed how to pay for them and you know what you would do to implement. And so, uh, so the Mary Ann's, I'll go with the, the custom of the day, uh, have, have been co-authors on one of those proposals, or Garfinkel has been on another. Um, and so one thing I was just going to ask, if you, if you want to comment on overall scheme and, and if you see a benefit as opposed to just doing a larger or fully refundable tax credit, child tax credit, um, and, you know, whether you see some efficiencies to replacing some of pieces of existing programs to help pay for it. And one of the reasons I want to bring it up is because when uh, Marion Bittler talked about the, the universal basic income at a high level at $12,000, you know, it was whatever, $3 trillion or whatever it was. But the estimates for the child allowance are much, much lower. I mean, it's also a, 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 a less generous benefit. So do you want to? Sure. So the, the chart I showed where I showed what the sum of the IPC, the child 
child tax credit and the exemption clause. That was kind of pump shaped to make the point that people at the very bottom are not getting, sorry, are not getting those tax benefits. There was a straight line there. If you repurpose those, people who are getting a lot of the IPC would be worse. But you could give two thousand dollars to every kid. Now, obviously, we just reformed the tax system, so that's not going to happen. But you could afford to pay for around two thousand dollars for every kid by repurposing those things. And if you're willing to, if you want to keep the work incentives of the IPC, you would just have to spend more. What about the um, what about the um, in these child allowance proposals about the responsibility of the non-resident parent. Is there a requirement that they be in the 4D program? Because that's also part of the political dynamic. <laughs> Americans, you know, will, will, are willing to support families, but they want families to do their part too. So if you're going to provide a further benefit to households with children in them, and then not do something about ensuring that the non-resident parent is paying something or providing something. In the di di dialogue we had with um, Maria, that was the give. Provide more assistance, but require support. So uh, as you know, I'm very much in favor of child support enforcement. Uh, but I would not make that the criteria <laughs> for uh, getting a fundable tax credit. I agree with Joe the economic difference fully refundable child tax credit and a uh, universal child allowance. There is, yes. they're, they're identical economically in terms of cost. Uh, but the, uh, I also agree with Bonnie, the difference would be how you administer it. And I think it's crucial for families with children to get payments once a month regularly, uh, not just as in the EIPC once a year. But it, in the proposal that uh, we've been working on, literally, if you do $2,000 a year, you could keep the EIPC. You could even expand the EIPC, which is, I would be in favor of. I'm very pro work and I'm pro marriage, too. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we, know, we, we know a lot about how to incentivize and encourage work. And the EIPC does a wonderful but that's not the only issue that is at play in terms of child development. And economic security is really important. We have good evidence that insecurity is really damaging to child growth and development. And right now, the number of families with children that are economically insecure is really big. And this would make a big difference, especially. Do you want to continue this debate or not? So, uh, so, yeah. so my, my brother just moved to Canada and had a baby there. <laughs> not only does he get $200 a month in a, a child payment, which I, I would agree functionally is, is completely different from giving them $2,000 a year once, once a year. Uh, but they also, the mother gets a month of maternity leave and then either parent can take a year of paid, return, uh, paid parental leave after that. Um, and so that struck me, Robert, you said you want to encourage work, and Canada is essentially actively discouraging work for the first year of the baby's life. Um, how literally should I take your, your words if we want to encourage work? We want to encourage parents to get back to work a day after the baby is born, a week, a, a month, a year, a decade, that, like, at what point do we want to encourage work? There is research on this. Yeah. Uh, there, is some re there, there is some research that suggests that, uh, you know, roughly, I mean, obviously there's no uh, absolute number here, but uh, roughly after about six months, uh, it actually, longer uh, periods of paid leave discourage mothers from ever coming back into the workforce. Uh, now, I personally would not like to see women going back to being, you know, full-time homemakers and, and mothers and being discouraged from having careers. So I'm all in favor of a certain amount of paid leave, but I think that the, the European countries and maybe Canada as well uh, 
uh, well, probably not Canada, but the European countries who have very long paid leaves for mothers, for mothers mostly, not fathers, did it because they were worried about fertility and they put those laws on the books in the wake of um, a decline in fertility and in the wake of World War II, and I think they haven't been updated. So yes, let's have paid leave, but let's not go back to um, encouraging women to stay home and be full-time mothers. Uh, in New York, in the wake of uh, the welfare reform bill, we imposed fairly strict uh, work engagement requirements for new mothers on cash assistance. Um, I think it was six months it might have been. And um, well, we've mandated childcare. You can't require someone to do something unless you also provide childcare in that circumstance. Um, and that was a concern about what the effects would be and we watched it. And I think we got um, certainly more work and greater income and I think less poverty and we didn't get uh, significant increases in, um, or any increases in sort of downside effects for children. So I, I was worried about that. That's a pretty strong requirement. If you want cash assistance, we're gonna ask you to go back to work within six months. And, you know, a disaster did not occur. And I think a lot of benefits occurred. familiar with this child allowance, any discussions on the details around it. And I'm just wondering, you know, I think there's a lot of research on benchmarks that need to be met for children between zero to five in order for them to be kindergarten ready that are not only preschool. Um, and that family has a really important role to play in making sure that they're meeting those benchmarks. And I'm just wondering if the conversations around this child allowance um, can contemplate um, I'm saying this, and I'm worried that it's going to sound bad, but contemplates imposing certain requirements on the family that they're meeting in order to get it, to make sure that their children are developing appropriately, like making sure they're going to their well child visits. Um, on the, eight, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics benchmarks, those types of ideas. So, in our proposal, I think our thought process, and you guys any time, I think they're correct, um, was that, you know, kids shouldn't, whether or not they're going to support the government shouldn't be contingent on whether their parents are working. And I also think we weren't thinking of this as a conditional cash transfer, so what you're talking about sounds a lot more like Progressa or sort of some of these conditional cash transfers. We are thinking of an unconditional cash transfer because we're a rich country and we can afford it. Um, but I'm sure other people contemplate yeah. other in New York City, uh, yes. under Mayor Bloomberg, we implemented an experimental program on a conditional cash transfer with regard to, uh, I think, healthy, healthy doctor visits, school performance, um, and it, I think it was, the results were mixed in terms of its mm -hmm. right, right, very good. Yeah. Uh, Robert, I agree with you. We have to do a job here, thing all by itself. Yeah. Uh, one. Uh, Child care, I'm going to talk about my state because I don't know about the rest of them. We got huge child care deserts, particularly in the rural areas. And so we've been, uh, we can talk all we want about putting moms to work. This is mostly violence, but there are some places child care is just not available. Mm -hmm. The second thing with child care is that uh, you want uh, a consistent workforce, and child care workers are not consistent. They're turning over a lot because we don't pay them a lot. Mm -hmm. You get more money going to work for Walmart than you do doing child care. So the affordability of child care uh, right now is an illusion, I believe. The working poor basically can't afford child care. And if they could, if they have it available, they can't afford really good child care unless the state supports us in some way. And the other one that I don't think most people have looked at is that low income families, when they send their kids to school, have an educational de deficit at kindergarten. And so what we need is a child care system that actually starts to bridge that gap. We beat up on the K through 12 because of the uh, educational gap, but it actually starts at home. So one of the things that good child care quality would give us is a way to start to deal with the educational gap earlier. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that 
it relieves some of the pressure on single parent parents. So it's not just about working, it also leaves some of the pressure on having to do this all by yourself. So to me, the child care has more than just supportive of work. It's all supportive of low income kids. And it's also supportive of giving single parents some relief. And so I think when we talk about child care, there's a lot of things we need to talk about here. And one of them is, the biggest one for me is that in the rural areas, we don't have a lot of child care. I have a question for you with Secretary Elvis Anderson about child care. Um, but wanted to <coughs> mention this $2,000 figure that you all are talking about because if you look at what parents spend either through our national survey that we funded of the whole country representative, national representative, the costs for those who pay are somewhere around five to six thousand dollars. And then if you look at the pricing that gets put out as averages state by state from like Child Care Aware and others that do that, it can be ten to $20,000 a year. So I guess I'm struggling with the $2,000 figure and the big difference that it's, you all think it's gonna make. Well, I think there are people here who, who, who think it's going to, to uh, who are in favor of it. Uh, and I think one of the things that I'm sitting here thinking and or wondering about how they're thinking is you can't live on $2,000 a year. So you've got to presume that people are working uh, or at least married and living with someone who's working. Otherwise, this $2,000, all it's going to do is, you know, just boost your income some. I'm all in favor of boosting income, but why not boost it? because it's so much politically more feasible uh, through something like the earned income tax credit or what I call a worker tax credit. And I couldn't agree more with um, Eloise, is that right? Sorry. Um, that your point about that uh, we need good child care and if I had to choose, you know, we don't have unlimited funds uh, politically. I mean, I understand we're wealthy and uh, but if I have to choose between spending money on high quality child care and an EITC versus the children's allowance, I'm going to fix the first two first. So it's a priority issue. Yeah. 